Tenakota Kato and Harry Mai, and thanks to all for joining us this evening for our light rail virtual event. My name is Tracy Ryan and I'm the Managing Director for Oricon. Um, I'd just like to first, if we kind of start, just there was two emails today which made me reflect and pause for a moment, and I just wanted to share both of those with you today. One is, as you know, there's a campaign which has been around for many, many years, which started in Australia around Are You OK? And today it did make me reflect when I got that email from my colleagues in Australia to ask me that question, are, am I OK? And as we all know, we've had the past 18 months have been very, very challenging and have been really, really tough for many of us. And as we've seen also for the last couple of weeks, and I think it's really highlighted the importance to stay connected and to stay supporting one another around us. And as we've changed this to a virtual event rather than being together in Auckland, I think it just should remind us of that little message and a very simple message to kind of check in on one another and ask, are you OK? And I think it's important to trust your gut sometimes and maybe for us to reflect at the end of this event to say, is there someone that you'd like to reach out to, to say, hey, how are you going? Are you OK? And I think it's important that we still to do it now that we've really gone through a virtual world of where we are at the moment. The other thing I'd just like to make um, and be able to mention around an email which came in from our friends at Mates in Construction. Tomorrow actually is World Suicide Prevention Day. And last year, our mates, our, our friends in Mates of Construction ran a really, really great campaign out in site where they raised the flags in support and also in remembrance of, of the individuals and loved ones that we've lost through suicide. This year, they've asked us to come together and to actually light a candle in our windows tomorrow at 8 p.m. as the world comes together to actually remember our loved ones that are lost and survivors of suicide. So I just thought I'd actually share that amongst this group today and just remember, remember that moment at eight o'clock tomorrow night. But let's just get into the, the event itself today. Um, I'd like to just really reflect and just talk a little bit around what we're going to be talking around today. Auckland Light Rail will be one of the most transformational projects New Zealand has ever seen. It will reshape our city, giving Aucklanders greater transport choices and also driving lowering carbon emissions and uplifting communities by increasing access to jobs, housing, education and other amenities. And I'm sure we're going to hear much more of that this afternoon from our guest speakers and the aspirations, outcomes and benefits that could be achieved from this project, which will be felt from generations to come. And I know there is a lot of interest, which and I'm sure there'll be many, many questions which will come through. Auckland has had the privilege of delivering a range of light rail and mass transit projects around the world, including in Gold Coast, Par Parramatta, Newcastle, Singapore, Hong Kong and Mauritius, and some which we'll hear from my colleagues who are joined us um, from Sydney later on today. And in every case, these projects have unlocked wide ranging opportunities for cities and communities um, that inhabit. And I've experienced this actually myself first, first hand in the way light rail projects can transform cities. From my experience on the Lewis line, when I was working back in Dublin in the late 1990s, I actually worked um, through the inquiry of Bor Planola and also some of the consentings of the Lewis line back in Dublin in, in the late 19s, early 2000s. And like Auckland, Dublin once had an ex extensive and well-used tram system with a peak close to around 100 kilometres of active lines, which were heavily used, it was profitable, it had great passenger facilities, and also had advanced technology with a near full electrification completed by 1901. And this ran right up to 1949 when the last tram actually um, got cancelled in Dublin. And the reason why, you know, we, as we saw many cities around the world in that time that we were, we relied very heavily on the private vehicles and buses became the future of transport. And at that time, and at that time, unfortunately and very sadly, the tram systems were removed and, and very similar around, around the world. Around the late 90s, Dublin was facing similar challenges in Auckland is now. Growth pressures, congestion from heavy car dependency and a need for sustainable transport options. So reviving light rail or mass transport really unlocked the city, improving accessibility and driving urban development. And in fact, it's a little bit like coming full circle. And some of the tracks with a loose line ran over areas where those trams, those previous tram tracks of the past have one been used. And up to now, I think prior to, to COVID hitting Ireland and back in 2019, about 41 million users are using the tram systems in Dublin today, which averages around 120,000 people per day. And for someone who experienced that, it truly has transformed Dublin into a global city that it is today. 
So now it's it's Oakland's turn again to embark on that journey and our journey towards light rail. So it's a real privilege to have and, and to have Tommy Parker, Lee Ayton, and Amanda Harlan here this evening from the Oakland Light Rail team to share how the project is progressing and what the next steps that we will expect. And I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions. So around 5.40, and we will be opening up the floor for Q&A. So you can use the panel on the right-hand side of your screen to type in any questions that you might have. And I imagine, and I believe many have already started to come in, so please um, keep, keep them coming throughout the presentation. Um, I'm now going to hand you over because obviously tonight, Oracle, we're delivering this event in sponsorship and in partnership with Infrastructure New Zealand. So I'm now going to hand over to Claire Edmondson, who's the General Manager of Infrastructure New Zealand, to share a few words, and she will act as your MC for this evening. So, Claire, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Tracy. So, Tena Koto Kato, and welcome to our Infrastructure New Zealand event on Auckland Light Rail, which is kindly sponsored by Oricon. So, we're grateful to have Lee Orton, Tommy Parker, and Amanda Harland from the Auckland Light Rail Group here with us virtually tonight to hear about our project is progressing, what the timelines are, and what we can expect. So Auckland Light Rail is proposed to run from Auckland city centre to Mangere and is intended to provide the backbone for future light rail to the north and northwest Auckland. The government established the light rail group earlier this year as part of a fresh start. The group has been charged with developing a business case and making recommendations for Auckland's light rail. The group consists of Waka Kotahi, New Zealand Transport Agency, the Ministry of Transport, Auckland Council, Auckland Transport, Kanga Ora and Mana Whenua. So a little bit about our speakers. So Lee is the chair of the Auckland Light Rail Board and has extensive local government experience with a particular background in planning, infrastructure and transport. He has been involved in issues at nat national, regional and local levels in New Zealand. Lee served as the chief executive at Manukau City Council up until the formation of the, of the new Auckland Council in 2010 and he is the former president and inaugural fellow of the New Zealand Planning Institute and in, November, and in November 2009 received a distinguished service award for his significant contribution over many years to the image and practice of planning. He's also on a number of boards. Tommy Parker is the project director for Auckland Light Rail and is and is the Australasian consultancy lead for the global firm Arup. He has nearly 30 years experience in transport, urban planning and engineering in New Zealand and the United Kingdom. His previous roles included general manager infrastructure at Fletcher Construction and 13 years working at Waka Kotahi, including as group manager for highways and network operations. Tommy currently serves on the board of Auckland Transport. He has also chaired the New Zealand Construction Industry Zero Harm Group and North Canterbury Transport Infrastructure Recovery, the Recovery Alliance to Restore Infrastructure following the Kaikoura earthquake. So um, Amanda Harland is the Lead Growth and Spatial Advisor for Auckland Council. She has over 20 years experience in strategic urban planning, specialising in growth and, sp and spatial planning for Auckland. Prior to the formation of Auckland Council, Amanda led Manukau City Council's growth management approach and master planning for town centres. Her role with Auckland Council has seen significant contributions to the development of the Auckland Plan Development Strategy, as well as planning for growth in the future urban areas of Auckland. More recently, Amanda has played a key role in leading urban and spatial planning advice on behalf of Auckland Council for several key transport projects. So we welcome them all here today. And so Lee, Tommy and Amanda will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have about a 20 minute Q&A session. So over to you guys. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire and Tracy. It's Lee Wharton here. Um, kia ora koutou katoa, uh, malale alale, which is uh, it's Tongan um, Language Week in New Zealand. So I just reflect on 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 that. Um, look, thank you for the opportunity of uh, presenting um, this, this evening uh, on this, uh, as indicated, a pretty significant um, project for for Auckland and indeed for for New Zealand. Um, I just want to just spend a little bit of time around the governance structure, uh, which um, has been referred to. Um, but first and foremost, my role is as the uh, the independent chair of the establishment unit. Um, I was appointed in uh, 31st of March um, this this year. Um, I report um, 
to four sponsors. Um, that is the Minister of Transport, uh, the uh, Honourable Michael Wood, the Minister of Finance and our Deputy Prime Minister, um, the Honourable Grant uh, Robertson, uh, the Mayor of Auckland, um, Phil Goff, and the Deputy Mayor, um, Councillor Bill Cashmore. And I think that's significant in the, in the sense that this is both a central government and a local government um, um, a project, and they are um, my sponsors, which uh, we report to regularly. Uh, they give us guidance, give me guidance uh, in terms of the key issues um, of the project. So just turning to the slide in, in front of you, uh, it was mentioned um, the governance structure and the board. I, I, do go, I do want to run just through it in terms of the names, which will be relevant, particularly to the New Zealand audience. But um, we could start at the top, um, Waka Katahi. So the CEO, Nicole Rosie, is, is, on, is on the board. Um, the Ministry of Transport, the CEO of the Ministry, um, uh, Peter Mercy, is, is on the board. Um, Kaingora, uh, Katja Lenz, who's an urban designer for Kaingora, uh, um, is, is, is on the board. Auckland, Auckland Transport, Shane uh, Ellison. Um, in the Auckland Council, um, we actually have Jim Stabak, who is the CEO, alongside Councillor Chris Darby, who is, uh, who is head of the planning uh, committee, which is an influential uh, committee of the council. Uh, and we also have Margie uh, Watson, who represents six local boards. So in Auckland, uh, we have the Auckland Council and we have um, uh, 21 local boards, of which six are directly um, uh, involved with this, this, this route. We also have um, mana whenua representatives. Um, uh, we have um, Naringwa Blair from Ngāti Whātua Orake and Karen Wilson Tiakate Awahua. Um, and they uh, bring uh, quite uh, a critical element to this to this, this project. So what we've been tasked to do by government is, is to predict progress an indicative business case for the city centre to Māori. So it is the first part of a, uh, a longer um, process and, and Tommy will um, outline uh, the sort of the next next phase where we move into the, the detailed business uh, case. But we are tasked um, to progress that, uh, to present to, to the Ministry of, of Transport at the end of September. So we're we're getting pretty close to some key decisions and obviously writing up the report uh, with the intention of going to the cabinet um, in November, mid-November. Mid um, that business case um, will advise on the delivery entity options. Um, and again, we can cover that um, uh, through this, this um, uh, presentation. Um, to set up uh, Mana Whenua, partnership. Um, so this is about uh, early uh, informing uh, and early engagement with recommendations in terms of the project for the next detail phase of Mana Whenua, um, its uh, involvement in this project. And uh, importantly, to engage with stakeholders and communities. Um, we have taken a view um, that we need to, to, um, to, to Inform, engage, particularly the communities um, along along the uh, the, the proposed um, route, which is fairly broad, um, but definable from the city centre through to Māori uh, and through to the to the airport. And so we've actually gone deep into that, and I have to say, very encouraged by um, that in, that engagement. So, for example, the engagements in places like Māngari, uh, which typically don't get involved in, in um, the normal media, the normal um, processes uh, that a lot of the population is engaged with. We've been able to reach into that community through Samoan radio, through Tongan, um, through the churches, et cetera. So we've had a deep, a deep engagement in those communities and got uh, fantastic feedback in terms of their aspirations in terms of this project. Um, and that's, um, uh, the, the indicative business case is to enable decisions by the cabinet in terms of the mode, which we'll talk about, the route, which we'll um, talk about funding and financing and um, the delivery entity, as I've mentioned before. I just want to um, make one comment, um, and it was referred to in the introduction. Um, this this is about a, a, um, a, a transit mode, which you know has been built in a number of um, places, many cities around the world. Dublin being a great example. Um, it is about 
uh, nonetheless, and the outcomes from this are about how we shape our city uh, for 30, 40 and beyond generations. This is a long term, a long term project. And I guess as a professional planner, it's one of the things that excites me around this this project. Uh, and Amanda Harlan will talk about um, that, 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 that shortly. So next, so this is a this is the program. So as I mentioned, we set up uh, and appointed in 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 April. Um, we began the partner stakeholder engagement, community engagement in June, um, and that's carried right through till um, the end of August. We had to uh, with level four uh, lockdown here. Um, we had to quickly change mode, but it was a very successful nonetheless in terms of online interaction interaction. So a lot of community focused listening sessions, events. Uh, we've all been um, to the various markets around uh, Auckland, uh, including the minister, including the mayor, including um, most of the board, if not all of them, at some some stage during July and August. Um, so, getting community feedback and insights uh, to include into the business um, case. And so, uh, that's as we're up to. As I say, this month is about key decisions and um, and pu putting the report through to through to the uh, Ministry of, of Transport. We'll talk about at the, uh, the end of this um, presentation in terms of the next stage, um, but by that stage we'll have had a presentation from Tommy Parker, who's going to uh, start with the next the next slides, um, and then we'll have Amanda um, Harlan talk about the urban form. So Tommy, turn over to you. Thanks, Lee, and kia ora. Good evening, everybody. Um, great to be here having this this conversation. So, yeah, as as Lee says, we've been in, on the working for a few months now to progress the business case and the the social license. Um, and really, one of the key aspects, as anyone that's involved in business case knows, it's about you know defining the issues that we're looking to solve um, and the opportunities that we can can reach. Um, and fundamentally, um, this project is about responding to Auckland's growth. Um, you won't need me to tell you, uh, you'll have seen the stats that, you know, Auckland is growing fast, has grown very fast and will continue to, to do so. There's high demand for, for growth in, in our city. And so being able to re respond to that um, and in terms of both, uh, as Lee said, both the transport response um, and how that informs the wider urban form and city shaping response um, is a fantastic op opportunity. Go to the next slide, please, Jeff. So yeah, defining what the problem is that, that we're looking to solve, very important for every business case and forms the, the foundation of um, the project that allows us to, to, to take it forward. So, so the, with the growth that Auckland is experiencing, um, there were three um, problem statements that, we, that we're looking to respond to. One is the increased congestion. I was saying Auckland's becoming famous for its congestion. Um, and now we're just seeing it's not just car congestion, uh, we're getting bus congestion um, as well. And that is disrupting um, travel times, threatening investment and the quality of, of life. That high reliance on private vehicles um, is adversely affecting the climate. Um, so we have a pollution, a growing pollution and emissions issue. And we all know the, the challenges in front of us in terms of climate change um, and how we address the emissions issue inherent in our current transport um, and land use and land use patterns. And finally, um, the third one is around our communities and strengthening uh, the need to strengthen and, and build strong communities within within the city um, and that have access to, to public transport. So we're seeing along the course of this route a huge um, difference in equality um, in terms of access to, to public transport. So some of the suburbs that we this route goes through have the lowest level of public transport accessibility and quite often they're the lowest socioeconomic groups so what we're seeing people that are most reliant on the private car are the ones who can least afford to, to run them so those are the three three issues so we've got a congestion a capacity issue we've got an emissions problem and we've got a community growth and and service for public transport issue so if we address these problems um, through this project, what will we see? Well, we'll see enable uh, increased urban density and economic growth. Um, you know, Tracy in the introduction mentioned about one 
scheme, but we'll see schemes across the world um, which have led to huge urban uplift um, and economic economic growth, economic stimulus. We'll see increased community well-being, as I'm saying, greater access to jobs, greater access to opportunities, lower travel times, lower commuting times, um, and those benefits. We'll see an improvement in the environment um, and that need to decarbonise um, and re reduce the, the pollution, and then that improved public transport accessib accessibility um, and more equal distribution of uh, of public transport accessibility across the across the city. So that's the basis of our of our business case. What we've also been out is to start to to look at at options and to start to talk to the communities about options. A lot of you will be aware that you know a lot of work has been done on on this. Um, this project before, and uh, there have been a number of um, initiatives. But as um, I think as Claire mentioned, this, uh, this is a fresh start. So, and what we're really looking to do is build that social mandate to really get people to understand um, the issues, the trade-offs, and the and the opportunities. So we did look. Um, we did a long list of options, over 35 different routes and and modes serving this corridor, and we were quite quickly through multi-criteria analysis, able to, to, to get it down to a couple of um, key modes that we've been um, consulting on. Um, one we're calling modern tram, the, the, the surface road running option most of you would be familiar with, you know, being in the Gold Coast and, and, and Melbourne, um, but, you know, running integrated with the um, urban streetscape um, and with high number of, of stations every sort of 500 metres um, along sort of slower end-to-end -end route, but serving more more stops. The other op option we've been looking at um, is a light metro, so segregated from the from the streetscape. Um, th in this example, and shown in the picture by a tunnel um, below below ground. This is a cut and cover um, tunnel option that we've that we've used as an as an example. Um, and then we've been looking and discussing the trade-offs between the, between those different different modes. I would say that we've also, for the, those tunnel enthusiasts amongst you, um, not looking just at cut and cover options, we have a broadening investigation looking at um, board tunnel options um, as well. Obviously, these have different outcomes um, and they also have different costs associated. So I should probably don't need to go through all of this. We kind of touched on those, but a number of different, different trade-offs um, and different opportunities for the the two um, light metro or modern tram options. Um, and when we come on to urban form, obviously you do get a different urban form um, with modern trams tends to be more corridor development with more regular stops, whereas light metro, you know, get more development around key stations um, and nodal points. Next slide, please. So, um, as Lee said in his introduction, this is one line in a future planned number of light rail um, lines within this within the city, um, which reflects the ATAP plan that um, was approved earlier, um, and that's the strategy that works. So we have a, a line planned for the northwest and for the northern. So the question is, why did we start with the, the city centre to Mungary line first? Primarily, it is related to the opportunities related to urban form. So this line runs from the two biggest economic generators um, in the city, so the CBD and the and the airport and the airport precinct. So high levels of, of economic activity at either end of the line, um, with opportunities to grow jobs and 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 houses. So some big numbers: you know, 170,000 uh, jobs, 21,000 new homes. That's with that's the currently forecast. We're looking at how that relates. 17% of Auckland's population and 33% uh, of the job growth will take place along this, this route um, with the opportunity for brownfield development uh, at scale um, and land owned by the by the Crown through Kangora, um, opportunities to develop that at scale. So those are the opportunities that made um, this route the, the first cab off the rank in terms of the um, light rail network. Actually, Jeff, we're going to go on to the next one. I'll just talk straight to the next slide, which basically covers the same. So, look, um, I'll just take you through the, the corridor. We're looking at a quite, quite a broad corridor with a number of different options, and we've had a lot of conversations around this with a number of different 
different stakeholders. Um, if we start in the, you know, the, as I say, what we're trying to do in this phase, in the addictive business phase, understand the trade-offs, understand the opportunities, um, and how do we maximise the, the benefits in order to justify the business case. All the detailed design, a lot of the master planning, a lot of the work will follow in the detailed business case, but this is looking for the core um, justification. So some of the issues, um, where do we start? There's a big desire to start within Winyard Quarter and serve Winyard Quarter with a, with a station. This is um, significant because, as I said, we're wanting to connect this route across the harbour in, in the future um, and, and work with the future harbour crossing opportunities. So how we, um, where we locate the station and the opportunity within Winyard Quarter has a big bearing on, the, on that. Then through the, um, through the city centre, the key issue, and you won't be surprised to hear this, is around um, disruption and, and the extent of business disruption. And you'll know there's a fairly live debate around CRL um, on, on disruption and, and small businesses, um, and that's been very top of the, the, the conversation of how which does tend to, to drive towards the, the, the tunneled and, and the, the segregated options. Also looking at um, the um, opportunities for station locations with a tunnel op option, um, you can have more flexibility about where you can locate the stations and those um, centres for future economic development. Um, one of the key benefits uh, we've seen on the tunnel option is have a um, station in the learning zone. So between Auckland um, AUT and Auckland University, you can have a, a university precinct. And the model sh modelling shows that the university station would actually be the second busiest on the route. So very high demand for uh, the access to, to edu education. Coming further down, uh, we come through the Dominion Junction area, which is again high opportunity for intense uh, development and, and land land development. Um, and then we have looking at options down both um, Sandringham Road and Dominion Road, both at grade and, and uh, below ground. Um, and they're different trade-offs and different opportunities. There are actually different land use land uses. There are different planning constraints, the different zonings. Um, between the two different routes and there are also different interchange options going down Sandringham does allow you to interchange at Kingsland um, and as much as possible in terms of making these benefits we're looking at how this route inter interacts with the rest of the rapid transit network um, so that with heavy rail ferries um, and rapid bus networks to make sure that we're optimizing the total the total system and, and Kingsland is an opportunity um, there as I said before, there are different land development opportunities in the different corridors um, and a lot of land owned by Kaingora that we're looking to optimise how that um, how that develops. Um, south of the, coming down to the isthmus from Mount Roskill, um, the route progressed along State Highway 20 corridor where there is sufficient width to allow um, rail in, the, in, in that corridor and then really uh, in the lower southern part of the route, how you serve the town centres. So Mount Roskill, Onehunga, Mungary Bridge, Favona and, and, and Mungary. Um, opportunities um, to either go past the, the town centres, um, which is cheaper and to stay in the motorway corridor, less disruption, um, less property take, but obviously losing some of the benefits of uh, urban regeneration, urban form. Um, so the opportunity also exists to go through the um, through the town centres and, and locate the, the stations in, in prominent um, community centre locations. And interestingly, in the engagement that we've undertaken, strong preference for the latter to have a very prominent don um, rail in the community serving um, and, and as a basis, as a catalyst for uh, regeneration um, of those, those communities. Also with only hunger, of course, there is a heavy rail connection there um, that we'd be looking for, you know, platform to platform um, connections there would seem to be the obvious uh, driver for that. Um, and then finally, connecting into the airport precinct, look, the airport precinct's high growth and opportunity um, of employment. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of the perception of this line and the public perception at the start was that this was kind of a fast rail um, between the CBD and, and, and Auckland Airport for people going, the holidays, as you'll have seen, as we go past, that's not the, the, the core problem statement that we're trying to trying to solve. That's not the purpose. What this is about is getting those opportunities. So for people in those areas on Ahunga and Mungary to be able to access jobs at the airport quickly, reliably, 
um, huge opportunities to um, to lift economic um, opportunity there. Also, of course, the transport planners be aware there's a, um, an airport to Botany uh, rapid bus coming in from from the east, and again we're seeing great benefits in terms of interchange um, between this rapid transit service and and, and that one, um, and those are the kind of uh, points that see you know see that kind of kind of lift, but also serving the airport as well. The airport requires to meet its future plans a, a significant modal shift, about 30% modal, modal shift, um, and this would obviously greatly assist that objective. Jeff, I think, yeah, and look, this is my final slide, just really saying that, you know, this is more than um, uh, a transport pro um, project. It is around um, integrating uh, transport and, and land use together to get the optimum view. I know I'm going to get asked about the about the costs, and I'm not going to give out any figures at this stage, I'm afraid. But never to certain say the cost will be a big, whichever option we go for will be a big, um, scary number. So in order to justify that investment, um, and in order to to convince Treasury to to invest, we need to show that we can optimise the benefits and really get a, a, a strong return for that investment. And that's about being looking at the the transport economic and, and land use and community benefits as one um, collective collective package to really release um, Auckland's potential and that's what's so exciting about this about this project. And now I'd like to hand over to, to Amanda to talk a little bit more about that urban development. Thanks Tommy. I just like to um, reiterate um, the points Tommy made. This is a huge opportunity um, to realise the potential of uh, light rail investment um, for Auckland's growth. And um, uh, I guess an additional point to what Tommy um, was talking about in terms of the urban context and why um, light rail uh, in this line for this route um, is around, uh, I guess, the permanent nature of this investment can um, help to stimulate um, private and other public investment. Um, it sends a, a clear signal to the market. Um, it's a you know a chosen um, public investment. This is where um, investment is going um, and can follow. So to shape um, the future of Auckland, Auckland's growth. So in terms of the indicative business case phase. Um, we were tasked with, I guess, answering some three pretty fundamental questions um, around the potential urban development opportunity in this corridor with light rail investment. Um, another key issue that we've spent quite a lot of time um, talking about um, politically, but also within our um, project team is that desired scale of growth. What is that? What does that look like? Um, and how does that support the investment and what level of investment? Um, and how does that deliver quality urban transport outcomes in an integrated nature? Um, and then, of course, uh, just um, building the light rail, um, we know is not enough. What are the challenges to delivering um, urban change? To overcome, uh, overcome those. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, this slide has been uh, quite useful in terms of articulating that scale issue, what the opportunity and um, and um, it's fair to say that Auckland is very much at the um, the lower end of this. If you like to um, see this as a um, a, a continuum of um, development um, and density. It's, um, it, sh it shows the relationship between um, development and, and levels of intensification uh, and scale and different modes. Um, so Auckland is very much at the lower end of that, that scale and it's starting to transition um, through to um, seeing much higher levels of 
of density intensification in particular locations. We've seen a significant change um, since the Auckland Unitary Plan um, upzoned a lot of um, areas of Auckland. Um, around 80% of our um, consents that are coming through are in the existing urban area, and the majority of those consents um, are actually in the higher uh, forms of or typologies of um, intensification, higher end. So still seeing predominantly four or five storey developments um, for apartments um, and a lot of terraces. And there's a, a significant step change that we need to make in order to see the, the levels of intensification um, that are consistent with a light rail and light metro um, investment. So what you can see from this um, slide is that the that light rail and light metro are more akin to the Melbourne Vancouver style um, development, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. Um, and at the much the more extreme end of the scale, um, we're looking at you know a Singapore um, type of uh, city or density um, correlating to um, a system. Um, a much higher capacity rail system, um, such as the like Metro Plus. Um, now, we're probably looking more at the Melbourne, Vancouver um, sort of style of, of intensification um, and corresponding in investment. So I guess the key message here is that, you know, Auckland is, is changing, it's changing fast, but we still have um, quite a step change um, to go in terms of realising um, development that is um, supportive of a light rail and light um, metro um, investment. Um, and this, I guess, out of the, you know, the, the thinking the broader um, net, long term network, um, this, this um, corridor has the most, I guess, potential, is most ready um, to accommodate that kind of change. Um, and yeah, it's, um, it's a huge opportunity to, to um, make a difference and transform um, Auckland. Um, I think that was my last slide. On to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah so, so. you'll finish off, Lee. Thank you. Yes, I'll, yes, I'll pick it up here. Um, so, introduce the indicative business case, which is in the blue at the start of um, this presentation. Um, this is to inform the Cabinet, as I indicated. Um, we are talking um, and part of the advice to the, um, in the business case, advice to the Cabinet um, as to the transition uh, into the, um, the, ne the next stage. We are keen um, and I'm pretty sure the government uh, will be uh, to make sure that we can keep momentum on this this project. Um, uh, it is important that we give confidence um, to the market that this project is going to proceed, and there's certainly a reindication in terms of that from the government that, that it will um, uh, will do it will do so. I think we can have a reasonable de degree of confidence that this project. Um, uh, we'll move into the to, into the next next phase. So you can see there what that looks like, and you can ask Tommy uh, during question time as to the, what the detailed business case, uh, the more uh, what that um, involves. But it does involve, you know, setting up the entity, having the doing the uh, the more detailed um, design, uh, working um, through what it looks like in terms of the interface with the communities in terms of um, urban design, planning and consenting, and then obviously cons cons construction starting, we would anticipate um, in two to three, two to three years time. So um, I'll leave it, leave it there and we're open for questions. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that, guys. And apologies for the sound quality there. Hopefully it's all working now. Um, hopefully we've fixed it. So, um, Tommy, as you mentioned, you're not going to go into costs and you're not going into going to funding, but we did get quite a lot of questions on that. So that's um, good. Did you have any further comments on that? Oh, look, we, uh, we're providing um, advice on, on funding options um, and um, as part of the, the, the delivery um, advice. 
Um, we're looking at a full full suite, um, and the, you know, everyone will be aware there's a number of different different options options around that. Um, and yeah, look, costs obviously will be part of you know of the, as as the indicative business case and and working out the the BCR. Um, and as I say, the, it's it's big numbers. This is the biggest you know transport investment by some way um, in New Zealand. So yeah, you can people can imagine what the numbers are. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another one is around disruption. So there's a question here saying, what learnings from the George Street Sydney light rail project will you be applying to Auckland to avoid the business disruption, lengthy time and overrun litigation and cost blowouts associated with that project? Yeah, look, we're, we're looking to learn uh, lessons from across a whole range of, of international um, projects and international expertise. You know, so many cities around the world um, have already made this this move to light rail. We're, you know, we've we've got a lot to a lot to follow. Um, in terms of disruption, you know, you were seeing the um, minister's um, announcement earlier this week that you know big um, future big infrastructure projects are expected to compensate um, small businesses, um, and that that's got to be you know. Dealt with and, and uh, dealt with up, up front. Where we're really talking at the moment is the opportunities between the different modes um, to mitigate um, disruption, and um, you know, obviously, you know, tunnelling is does solve some of that that issue, but obviously has a, has other other impacts. As I understand it from from Sydney, you know, the, it was the utilities, and the utility diversions that was a, a big big challenge um, in the contract. Um, and you know we are looking at or discussing. It's not so important at this stage, but it will be certainly be very live in the next stage as to how we can mitigate um, those risks uh, early um, and de-risk the the project um, ahead of any big procurement. But that's that's really to be to be worthwhile at the moment. We're really focusing on the the overall sort of macro impacts and macro benefits. Okay. Here's another one. In the previous iteration of the project, it was framed by many as a fast train to the airport, whereas it's now described as more of an urban catalyst. What's changed? Yeah, no, look, I think, um, it, it, you know, that's this is the, the, the business case and the, and, the, and the direction of what, what problems are we trying to trying to solve? Um, and as I say, there was a lot of, um, in the previous iterations of the project, a lot of discussion ar around that. I don't think it was ever sort of you know grounded and and signed off. What we're trying to do this time um, and is to get that um, really detailed business case, really broad, show that we've done the option evaluation and show that we've done uh, the assessments that best responds to the the project objectives that I that I, I ran through. So um, yeah, this this time we've got fairly clear objectives, and I think the big one. Um, Claire, is the is that focus on urban form on providing housing um, jobs and opportunities at that scale that's the big challenge for for Auckland and the transport bit is actually just a part of that solution it's the, so it's our contribution to it to the bigger bigger issue but that's the that's the problem that's front of mind Great, thanks, Tommy. Um, another one, could light rail be built as light rail extensions of the existing heavy rail network, i.e. standard New Zealand gauge and electrification voltage, but allowing for steeper grades and tighter corners? Wow, that's technical. <laughs> yeah, no, that's probably a bit too, too technical. I, we have had that question before of our gauge, um, and we understand there is an option um, to have um, comparative gauge with our, with our existing um, what exactly that means um, and how that would work and if that would provide benefits um, will be something we consider consider downstream but yet yeah, it's not a um, it, we haven't closed the door to that okay um here's another one again about um so dominion road and sandringham road are already congested how would adding further traffic to either of these roads work would you be looking at compulsory purchase options? Sorry, so is this about? Sorry, can you just repeat that? I didn't broke up. Yeah, so, bit. yeah. So Dominion Road and Sandringham Road are already congested. How would adding further traffic to either of these roads work? Would you be looking at compulsory purchase options? 
Um, well, look, all major uh, infrastructure projects, the, the sort of compulsory purchase, we, you know, through the um, Public Works Act, um, lands can be can be purchased for for transport um, options, and that, that that that's possible. But this scheme is really around um, offering offering transport choice, um, and part, as we said, part of the decarbonisation of, of Auckland's transport system. So you know you've got to assume that there would be significant modal shift um, onto this, so to reduce that that congestion. Um, because of the capacities that light rail can carry, you can reduce the number of buses. So as I said in my intro, there's a number of bus congestion now happening. So lifting it to a bigger carrying capacity allows the the, 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 um, the city to grow um, without the you know increase in. Um, in, in congestion that would be associated if we didn't do do something like this. But it is about, you know, we are looking to, ch you know, it is about instigating change um, and changing in travel patterns and travel behaviours. So um, that's, you know, that will change the, con the congestion congestion dynamic. Oh, and finally, it's, it's really getting an integrated transport network. So really integrating free to service buses, heavy rail, ferries, I guess even airports were serving the airport, you know, so it's in all modes um, working together to get an integrated integrated network. Yeah. Um, gosh, we've got lots of questions here. Um, how long do you think the design phase would be if you're looking to construct in two years? Again, that's probably a possibly too early question, but. <laughs> no, look, I mean, I think, you know, we, we know, um, so look, we, we've we've got a broad idea, and we'll be coming, you know, to the market um, soon, hopefully, to 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 map out um, opportunities going going forward. The design phase for this and the detailed design process it will be more than um, traditional transport projects that we've done in in New Zealand because of that urban form. So a lot of this is about master planning these communities. These are going to be, um, you know. There's going to be a big urban form, urban realm, placemaking element to this that we need to understand to give confidence to the funders that um, that we're going to get the benefits. So it is a, um, you know, it is there's a lot of de detailed design, not just in terms of the the, the transport, but of, of the associated um, urban change. So it's it's not easy. Um, and look, you know, two years might be a bit. Um, optimistic. We've also got, you know, we've got a lot of consenting, a lot of property um, to work through, um, and of course we're not quite clear at the moment what the, you know, the consenting um, landscape will, will will look like. Um, but we're, you know, we, we're working through that. We know and we're mapping that out in terms of opportunities, and we hope to come to the market soon with a with a proposal for discussion. Okay. What are the, some of the key insights you've gained from the recent engagement in communities along? The route along the way. Oh, look, it's been a very, um, it's been a fascinating. I think I say we've got a very diverse city, and we've got very diverse issues across the, across the route, and that's so. In as I say, in the city, the, um, the small business voice and the disruption is very, um, very prominent, very high levels of of concern. Um, but big desire for um, more people to be able to access the CBD, um, you know, without the, the parking and the um, other challenges of getting in and, in and out of the, the CBD, and a strong desire from businesses in the CBD to see more people coming in, in and out. I guess you know, there's a bit of a question post COVID. You know, will people still be travelling to the to the city? Will people still be making that that, that trip? And from our engagement, a very strong indication that, that that's still um, the desire. In the southern part of the, the route, um, it's all it's life changing opportunities. We are, I've met people in the markets. One a couple uh, lived in South Auckland for 20 years and hadn't been to the, to the city centre. Um, opportunity, we've been speaking to people that haven't, you know, wanted to go to university, but actually the difficulty of, of travelling across every day. Um, was was prohibitive, so you know very strong um, support for for the scheme um, and for well, the, the concept and the opportunities that it will bring and the lifting of you know job access number of jobs within 45 minute commute it just it goes, gets very um, exciting um, when you see and when you're talking to those people they will actually um, whose life it will 
will change. Um, yeah, lots of other points um, and, and concerns, lots of ideas um, and, and, and good opportunities. As I think I said in the direction that, that uh, what was quite surprised me was the strength of feeling about bringing light rail right into the heart of those those communities and using it as this catalyst for development. That was uh, overwhelming support for, for that. So Claire, I just wonder whether I could just add, add, add to it. So if we take, um, for example, Māngari, um, local um, gentrification was is an issue. So um, when you when you uh, reshape the town as a result of, of, of this this investment, you know, concern amongst Polynesian community about um, gentrification. You know, they've already been displaced out of Greylin and and Ponsonby years ago. In fact, a lot of their churches are still there. And one of the challenges they have is actually on a Sunday, how you could reconnect um, from Mangari through through to Greylin and and um, and Ponsonby. So, but gentrification. So how that's handled in the the next stages going through of how you can allow for um, for them to retain um, their, uh, their their community to stay in that community. Desire for the route to go through the, um, the to the town centre, um, accessibility to Onihanga. Um, and so you know we can through this through this uh, consultation uh, through this um, engagement. You know we've got a, a whole lot of information from different communities. So if for example you're in uh, Dominion Road, um, Sandringham, there's quite concern about heritage. You know housing, um, you know which is protected under the under the unitary plan. So you know how how do we de how do we handle that if it's if there's going to be intensification ar around that, and obviously disruption and in, in um, from uh, Dominion Road uh, businesses, etc. So we have a, pr a very good handle after a lot of engagement, a lot of feedback of the key issues along the route. Great, thank you, Lee. Cheers. Um, the next one. Oh, there's just so many coming in. I'm trying to pick one that's, you know, that we haven't answered. Um, transport needs to be decarbonised. That includes in construction. How is the embodied carbon and climate change implications can calculated in the business case? Um, I can't give you the the, the details around the the, the, the modelling, um, but, the, but you're absolutely right. The embedded carbon and the Ongoing carbon needs to be worked through. And clearly, um, there is big difference between the different options in terms of the um, embedded embedded carbon um, with the like you know the tunneling options. Obviously, taking a lot more concrete um, and and steel. Um, so you get this sort of big lump at the front, and then you know you look look at them over over the years of, of operations, so over 50 years, um, and have to just to sum up the. The benefits. So I'm sorry I can't say exactly how the, how the model, but I can assure you that it does cover. Well, it covers embedded carbon, um, the ongoing uh, carbon reduction, and also we've tried to capture the um, the, the difference in carbon of, of the of the land use. So bringing more dwellings into brownfield um, in our urban areas does have a, a, a carbon dividend over greenfield, um, and we try to to calculate that as well. So. Yep, yeah, it's absolutely key and going to be part of all our business cases um, going forward. So we've got to get good at that modelling and predicting. There's a lot of questions around procurement and the next steps there. So I'm not sure um, who would maybe want to answer one of those questions. Oh, look, yeah. So we um, we part of the um, the advice we're giving is around the um, the delivery entity and and the or the, the organisation and how the organisation or which organisation um, takes this takes this forward. Um, but we are also looked, mapping out uh, a program to try and maintain um, momentum um, on the project and keep building on the um, the work that we've that we've done. Um, projects stalled in the past. Um, so we were looking for a, you know, a detailed business case, that master planning capability that I was talking about, um, and um, consenting and, and property strategies, which we, would be the next the next phase, um, and we'll be looking to come to the market with a proposal around procurement for that um, soon, um, or not, not too distant future. In terms of overall procurement for the major works, I mean that's still a, a long term. Again, we've done some. Some thinking around that, and we're forming that, but that that decision won't be made for a for a while, a while yet. There's still a lot of work to be done in terms of um, understanding the 
the form of procurement for the for the physical works. Okay, great. Thanks, Tommy. This might be a question for Amanda. Um, but the urban uplift you're, di you're discussing would require moving away from the status quo. What kinds kind of interventions would be needed to maximise that objective? Um, yes, yeah, so it's a really good point. Um, so uh, the, the accessibility benefits we know um, alone in terms of what light rail will give won't won't be enough. They will give some benefit um, to uplift, but um, in order to maximise the investment, we need to do a lot more. So the kinds of things that we would need to do uh, fundamentally is, uh, as Tommy already mentioned, um, uh, master planning, um, and then that translating that to um, to understanding what changes need to be undertaken to the Auckland Unitary Plan and how far we go um, in terms of that. There's already been a significant um, amount of uplift um, across the city and in this corridor, but we need to make sure that the enabled um, capacity is in the right locations uh, across the corridor. So that is a um, a fundamental, uh, I guess, planning intervention. Um, there are other things that we need. We know we need to, will need to do, and that includes things like around land assembly. A lot of the corridor is quite fragmented um, in land ownership, so clearly we're going to um, to need to understand, you know, how much land amalgamation um, there is. We need to partner. Um, a whole government government approach is is critical. Um, to delivering the successful outcomes. Um, as many will know, Kaung Ora is already uh, active in, in uh, Māngari and uh, Mount Roskill in the corridor. Um, so it's about leveraging those opportunities as well um, and um, understanding what we need to do to make places market attractive. So it might include investment in placemaking. So those are just some of the interventions. OK, um, this might be a question for Lee, but how or will a change of government influence the project scope and outcomes? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can answer I, I, I'm not sure I can um, answer that, but right, quite clearly, um, and can I say I started my career um, uh, with an offer from New Zealand um, Rail or the equivalent back in 1975 when I left university. That was my first job offer. I actually never started it because uh, the the uh, the undergrounding of um, of central Auckland uh, never proceeded. Um, so I'm conscious that governments can come and governments can 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 go. Um, all I can say is that it's likely uh, that this project will be fairly well advanced um, by the next. Um, um, election period. I guess it's a matter for the community and the New Zealand um, New Zealand society to uh, determine whether it wants to, if in fact, change change the uh, the government um, that it, that this project proceeded. Great, thank you. Um, it's another question. Have you considered extending light rail from the airport to Purunui Station? Um, connects light rail and heavy modes. Yes, uh, that, that's that been looked at um, and look, obviously the Punui connection is uh, new services um, is up and up and running. Um, it, it's, it does have trade offs that, you know, um, slightly further or further, so further journey time um, versus uh, benefits. So yes, it is um, that has been in, included in the in the analysis. Right, here's another one um, around governance. Does the Auckland Rail Establishment Unit find it challenging to report to this many different entities with potentially varying in interests? I, I, I'd have to say um, that the, this entity is actually um, uh, excellent in terms of being able to um, pick up the voice of the Auckland Council as well as that of central central government. You look, I. Um, I've sat on a number of uh, uh, boards um, and have to say this one has worked um, very well indeed in terms of that interplay of getting those voices from whether it's Auckland Transport, whether it's from uh, Kaingora, whether it's from Ministry of um, Transport around around the room. We've been able to resolve, you know, a number of issues. Um, in fact, all of the issues by by um, by that forum. So 
it may not be a classical board forum, but actually I think it works really well. Um, I think it's critical thinking forward of what that, that entity might look like, of how it's actually designed, what is really critical because of the, the urban nature of, of um, and the urban um, uh, components of this, that it actually probably that entity reflects those um, those dynamics as well. So answer, quick answer, uh, it's, it's working well. I have the voice of, can I say, I didn't mention before, but Treasury are observers around that, that board and they're full participants in this, this process. So quite clearly they're key key parts on this. You know, from a governor's point of view, I keep in contact as a chair uh, with them on a weekly, fortnightly basis to make sure that we get an integrated approach to decision making. All right, thanks, Lee. Um, how are future connections beyond this project being con considered? So as I, as I said, Claire, the, in the, um, the, yeah, the connections to the to the north and to the northwest are important, and we've been very clear from the start we're not going to preclude options there. It does get quite, um, it gets quite complex in the engineering firm, in, uh, engineering context um, through the through the centre where you can't have all three um, lines converging in the in the CBD at, at grade. That doesn't work. So. Um, at some stage, you're going to have to grade separate um, on them. So we've been looking at options as to how, how that works and we'll advise on that. Also, you have to consider the capacity. So there'll be greater capacity when they connect through to the um, other lines. And that's been factored in in our, in our forecast and in our routes. So I'd say, you know, if our brief was to not preclude, we're probably doing slightly more than that and just sort of looking to, you know, see where, you know, en enable and what, um, what is the right sequencing um, of works, um, but looking very much at that long term, that full uh, ATAP strategy um, where you, you, the, they, the, they'll work um, together um, so that we can do that future, future planning at, at this stage. Great, thank you. Um, both ends of the route, so Winyard Quarter and the airport are vulnerable to the sea level rise of one metre, now considering likely by the end of the century. Um, how is this being factored into the planning for investment in the light rail network? Um, look, I think it's fair to say it hasn't been, um, you know, we're sort of assuming that, that you know, that, that can be engineered um, and uh, in the in the des detailed design phase, we, we don't see it as a, um, you know, a showstopper or a differentiator between the different routes and, and modes um, that, that, that we're considering at the moment. So at IBC level, I, I think that's not, um, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's an invalid point. I'm just saying I think you know, that we can deal with that in a, in a more detailed level further down. Um, what implications will this project have for Maori interests? Yeah, so um, we are in a process uh, in the IBC of, of um, informing and uh, engagement with the view to recommending through the uh, indicative business case for um, active involvement uh, in uh, for iwi in the in the in the in the second second stage, and we're giving advice uh, to the minister through that process. Uh, we are. I am personally um, fronting um, Hui with each of the chairs of 15 of the 19 uh, iwi in Auckland. I think I've had uh, with with the, with the Māori team within the unit. I think we've had 12 of the 15 um, Hui to date. So that is picking up, you know, the different you know, I have to say, uh, diverse uh, in, uh, interests of 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 iwi into that process, um, but. Uh, I can assure you that um, this will be a key part of the uh, indicative business case advice to the Crown. Okay. Are you including cycle lanes along the corridor and connecting the new stations? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, active modes is part of the integrated transport network and, and a lot of consideration has been given, not just along the corridors, but in the, the catchments. Um, and in the work that Amanda's been leading around the urban form, how that, that urban form is done in a way that provides access to the stations, walking, cycling, um, and electric scooters, etc., is, is is very much in the in the in the thinking. Okay. 
Um, not sure if you'd be able to answer this because you might not have um, detailed knowledge, but will the resource management reform proposal to remove amenity from the RMA help this project? That's maybe a little bit too... too um, yeah, no. Amanda might be able to help clear. Oh, yeah, I think uh, you're right, it's probably a bit too early to, to make a call on that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. Um, we'll probably just do the final question. What will industry market engagement look like in the next phase of this project? Yeah, that's a good good question. Um, I think Bill is saying that we, you, we plan to undertake it. I, I can't give much more detail than that at, 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 at this stage. Um, yeah, no, it, it, we would like to, under, you know, we need to sort of understand you know, get through this this phase, get the root and, and mode um, and shape of the project more more defined before um, you know, scoping out what the market engagement will be. But yeah, look, we know that there's going to be um, pressure on, on on resources, pressure on capability um, globally uh, around the skills that we that we need. So we are going to need to know um, and understand the market very very well. Um, and do full and in, in, in detailed in, engagement. I'm sorry, at this stage, I can't say exactly what that would look like. That's great. Well, thank you. And thank you for um, answering all those questions. We did get quite a lot in and I hope I've answered the majority of them that have come through, or at least the themes. So thank you for that. And thanks for people sending those through on the slide. Um, I now introduce Robert and Lauren. So. Robert Angus is Oricon's global light rail lead, responsible for the pursuit and delivery of Oricon's portfolio of light rail projects. He has led the planning, feasibility and design of several ma major light rail projects, including Newcastle, Parramatta and Sydney's light rail. And Lauren is an economist who specialises in infrastructure strategy. She, support, she supported the business case development for both Canberra and Adelaide Light Rail and currently sits on the project steering committee for the DNC phase of Parramatta Light Rail. Lauren is Oricon's Australian and New Zealand's precinct industry director responsible for supporting government and private sector clients to unlock the benefits of place through visioning, design pl and planning for large infrastructure projects. Great, thank you. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Claire. Um, it's exciting to see what's taking shape for Auckland with the opportunity for light rail to support urban transformation. Um, across the ditch, we've seen that transport has been significantly disrupted by COVID, but we know that we will get back to a new normal. I think many of us now are appreciating our local communities and seeing the value in 20 minute neighbourhoods in perhaps a way that we haven't before. And I think the concept of 15 to 20 minute neighbourhoods encourages walking and cycling and light rail is a great complement to more active and sustainable transport choices. It's also really important to understand the unique demographic makeup of the communities alongside the future corridors in order to fully understand how their lifestyle influences their transport choices. Next slide, please, Rob. We know that transport is an important part of city shaping and the attractiveness of cities as a place to live, to do business, depends on the quality of our public transport, as well as how well it integrates with the rest of the transport network. We saw that recently in Sydney when Google chose not to invest as an anchor tenant in the Bayes precinct because it wasn't being well served by public transport. We know that transport networks, as you've heard earlier, are the backbone of our cities, and we are becoming increasingly aware that transport access is crucial for the economy, particularly if you're planning to reshape cities in a post-COVID world. Investing in light rail has the ability to shape new communities, connect really great places, and help both locals and visitors alike move around and explore what Auckland has to offer. High capacity and reliable services can really open up great urban renewal opportunities. And I think beyond the focus on the transport connections, light rail really does have an ability to change the way that we think about place and the communities that it serves. To fully leverage the value of the investment that we're making in light rail, I think we've heard that it's really important to think about master planning our communities, thinking about rezoning to support housing and local employment growth, as well as looking at the other types of infrastructure and services that are going to be required to meet the future needs of those particular locations. 
I think we've got a unique opportunity to take a place first approach and create great places to live, work and play. Um, we know there's significant economic benefits to, to light rail, particularly around the land use activation. We know it can be a catalyst for urban renewal and regeneration. And as you heard from Amanda, the investment in the permanent infrastructure creates a lot more certainty for both the community and for local businesses, helping to encourage that investment in property development and urban renewal. Um, it helps drive uh, increases in land value, particularly in those lower density areas where we might be providing better public transport access and better transport choices. Um, light rail also has a higher user experience, which increases people's willingness to use it, creating both demand for housing and for access to businesses along the corridors. To really capture the benefits of light rail, it's important to have an appropriate business case and appraisal framework in place, one that considers the value and the impact on place and not just on movement. Um, Transport for New South Wales has made some really good progress in the space in recent years with the development of the movement and place framework, which is about making sure that we're getting the right mix of transport in the right locations to create those attractive places and spaces for people that they're actually able to enjoy. Next slide, please, Rob. One quick example if we can get it to pop up, is Fisherman's Bend in Melbourne, which is a really interesting example of a differentiated focus on urban renewal. The business case focused both on the value that could be created by the urban renewal components of the project, as well as the value capture mechanisms that could be applied to generate a larger funding envelope. Fisherman's Bend is one of the largest urban renewal sites in Australia and poses a really significant opportunity to improve the economy and to maintain Melbourne's reputation as a livable city. The project focused on the value that could be created by leveraging the opportunities around livability, increased business activity, sustainability, accessibility, and importantly, the integration with walking and cycling and other public transport services. The, the Fisherman's Bend framework included the assessment of well-serviced, medium and high density housing options for about 80,000 people, as well as looking at a diverse mix of uses and activities, public amenity and green space as well. There was a considered focus on the agglomeration of business activity and the attraction of high value and innovative businesses that would drive greater economic value for the precinct. Um, Fisherman's Bend will be the largest urban renewal Green Star community in Australia with a focus on energy efficient design and renewable energy. There was also a high degree of focus on the value created by connecting light rail with walking and cycling and other public transport options, which is helping to provide communities with more accessible and sustainable transport options. The value capture mechanisms, these are helping to create a more fair and equitable system by ensuring that those who directly benefit from the infrastructure are able to contribute to its cost. And this reduces the reliance on government as the sole funding source and also helps to drive a higher quality infrastructure and amenity. Um, thinking both early about the value creation for the project and the opportunities for value capture has um, helped create a much more robust business case, as well as the ability to realise the vision for urban transformation. Rob, do you want to take us through a couple more of the, the Sydney projects? Sure, thank you, Lauren. Look, across the Tasman Sea, the light rail renaissance has been realised in Australia since the early 2000s. Oricon's been involved in and active on almost every light rail project in Australia. These projects you see are a sample of our light rail pedigree with our involvement in planning, business case support, feasibility, optioneering, right through design, construction, and through to revenue service. But if we turn our minds to project implementation, what about the impact of disruption? Disruption really is only heartfelt when the end is unknown. I think about COVID a bit these days. This is an image of Parramatta Light Rail under construction from earlier this year. It's an area looking towards Eat Street, which is now a pedestrianised precinct in place, you know, benefiting the loved area of shopping and dining as a precinct. And if I take my eyes off the technical design of the stone sets that you see being laid and the importance of encapsulating rail boot, I also think about the retail businesses along this section of the corridor. 
And Transport for New South Wales has shown great leadership to build from lessons learned on similar projects uh, plan uh, for local businesses. It's not simply a matter of handing out payments. Think about some of the businesses in this environment. They're small and they've got challenging operational cash flows. So Transport for New South Wales initiated business impact assessments and business activation plans. What does this mean? It means community activities. It means retail incentivization, shop local campaigns, pop-ups, public domain installations. But from my understanding, what was valued most was the free business advisory services So for, for these small businesses. So one-on-one -on -one financial and business mentoring and opportunities such as online and product diversification and enacting this well before any impact actually took place on site. And when I think about corridor revitalization, Newcastle's introduction of light rail was paramount to opening up their CBD to the waterfront. This was particularly evident through the removal of heavy rail and delivering the first wire-free system along its entire route in Australasia. But the question is, when you're in the early stages of a business case, how do you communicate transformative vision like this? We'd like to sh finish by sharing an example of how Oricon's Unsigned Studio successfully communicated this transformative impact that Newcastle's revitalization would have on their community. Newcastle's a great place. And I just love this place to turn back into the, the glory days of what the Newcastle CBD was. to see more live music events in that area on the foreshore or in some of the parks there because I know every time we go in there we're looking for things to do but there's not very much happening. We've got all these beautiful views and the heritage. If we can work with that and come up with clever ways to get families playing outside then there's much more hope than I'd feared. Light rail and bicycle infrastructure and walking is what this city needs, in my view. Everywhere where they put light rail, we're seeing business boom and we've seen the area develop and actually become a much more um, efficient city. By linking the old city directly with the harbour would be a huge asset and encourage the free flow of people backwards and forwards. The whole area all the way down to that car park and across the Civic Theatre could be mm. nice open space with lots of gardens. And allow the, the uni students to come in the open space in the sunshine and study. Also I'd like to see it developed for families so it could be a dual purpose for the uni students throughout the week and then families on the weekend. People are excited about it. They can sort of smell it in the air and they know it's close. The business community now sees something happening and progressing and that means we can employ more people, we can employ more young people, that's, that's what we want. We hope to have strong job opportunities so that we can stay here in the yeah. future. Just needs that infrastructure behind it with transport and making sure it's still a safe and community orientated place. It's been dormant for long enough, it's, it's time for change. Great, thank you. And thanks everyone for coming this evening. We've, we've nearly wrapped this event up. I just want to thank the speakers and the panel tonight for being involved and all your questions that you sent through from the members. Also, I just want to give a little bit of a plug to our Building Nations Conference. It's now changed date to the 16th to the 19th of November. Um, we're now doing it across four days and we're, and we're delivering that virtually. But I hope that it's going to be a really great and event and I'm hoping to see you all there. So thanks for coming tonight. It's been a, a long night, but it's been a worthwhile night. So thanks again. Cheers. Bye-bye.